Good morning and uh, good evening, uh, depending where you are. Welcome to the CCG China and the World Dialogue series. I'm the host of this series, Henry Wang Hui Yao, and uh, I'm also the founder and the president of Center for China and Globalization. I'm incredibly glad uh, today to kickstart this new year with another episode of a dialogue series. And this time we have the distinguished macroeconomic investor, uh, distinguished uh, a uh, great business uh, leader, Ray Dalio. He's actually the founder, CIO, mentor, and board member of the Bridgewater Associates, a global leader in institution portfolio management, and also the largest hedge fund in the world. In 1975, uh, Ray actually founded an investment firm uh, out of his uh, two-bedroom apartment, Bridgewater Associates. And uh, this company now, over 40 years later, Bridgewater has grown into the fifth most important private company in the United States, according to the Fortune magazine. So after 47 years of running the firm, Ray has since successfully transitioned his, its management to the next generation of leaders, but remained intimately involved in the investing side and as a mentor to the firm. Ray is also a major philanthropist, deeply involved, devoted to protecting the oceans and closing the education, education and opportunity gap in this country, in the United States, for example. He's now in the third phase of his life where he wants to pass along what he has learned to help others be successful via his New York Times bestseller book, as well as the popular LinkedIn articles uh, for example, such as the mechanic of the war economy, uh, which I also I learned it from a lot when studying uh, Russian Ukraine, which is a great uh, article, and also economic studies. And of course, uh, 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 the, his book has been translated into Chinese. Uh, the, uh, the the principle, uh, you know, the the changing world orders. So from growing up in a middle-class family uh, in a long island and falling in love with Marky when he was only 12, uh, Ray has truly lived American dream. And uh, not only that, uh, along the way of running the Bridgewaters, uh, uh, Ray has discovered a set of unique principles that he's really great at summarizing and uh, had led to the Bridgewater exceptional effective culture which he has described that as idea of a meritocracy that strikes to achieve meaningful work and a meaningful uh, relationship throughout the radical transparency. So actually, Ray's book has been translated into Chinese and now become a bestseller in China, I'm sure in the world as well. And particularly his, his, his latest new book, I mean, the uh, uh, coming out uh, 2021, the, uh, the, the challenging of the world orders has been extremely important, important and enlightening. And uh, so we're actually going to discuss uh, his best-selling book, uh, Principle on Dealing with the Changing World Order, today. And here, precisely from uh, Ray again, on his uh, 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 treading principles, of course, on, on, on how he looks at the war in this uh, changing order and also the turbulence of our time. And also uh, now we are facing a you know, post-pandemic era and how we can uh, handle the uh, you know, world relations, US-China relations and all the other challenges. So, so, so Ray, I'm, I'm really glad you, you're taking the time uh, uh, out of busy schedule to join me. And maybe you can start your, uh, some opening remarks and say, uh, 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 something to our audience today. Thank you, Ray. Well, thank, thank you so much for having me. Um, I started to come to China in 1984 as a guest of CIDIC, which was the only window company at the time, the only company that could look at the outside world. And I've come through all those years. And so I've had the pleasure of getting to know people, good old friends and the culture, and to be able to contribute in some ways. And so um, I so appreciate the opportunity again to uh, exchange thoughts 
because I think that this is a particularly important time for mutual understanding. So thank you very much. I, um, you refer to the um, changing world order, the book about principles for dealing with the changing world order. Um, and what I learned in my life uh, over the years, over 50 years of macro investing, is that many things that surprised me, surprised me because they happened, they didn't happen in my lifetime before, but they had been many times in history. Pandemic is a good example. But I, I, I didn't realize that if I looked back on history, when these new developments occur, um, that I could learn the lessons of the past. And so there were three things that drew my attention that led me to study the last 500 years of history, particularly to study the rise and declines of world reserve currencies and the empires that were behind them. And those three things were the very large amounts of debt and money creation, the creation of debt and the printing of money in the reserve currency uh, to uh, monetize that debt. That's one. Never happened in these magnitudes before, in these levels of debt, this monetization. You have to go back to the um, 1930 to 45 period to see that. And it happened many times in history. The second is great internal conflict because of large wealth and values gaps uh, leading to very large political gaps of extremists of both sides, populists of the left and populists of the right, and that conflict. By all of those measures, wealth gaps, political gaps, and so on, uh, in the United States, the gaps are the largest also since the 1930 to 45 period. Actually, they're larger than that. You have to go back to 1900 to find them so large. And they are shaping the political decisions, the economic decisions. You could see it, and not only in the United States, but in many countries, but particularly, most importantly, in the United States. And the third force is um, the international conflict, the great power rivalry that most importantly exists between the United States and China now, and also, of course, uh, Russia, and those types of conflicts. Um, by all measures, and in the book you see all of these are measured, and you see statistics that go back 500 years, and you could see that these are the largest. So I studied that, and then when I studied history, I also saw two other major forces, and in China, you know it. Those are acts of nature is the first, and that, that shows that droughts, floods, and pandemics have toppled more civilizations and killed more people than wars or depressions. They have a bigger impact, very important. And of course, they are factors today. And the fifth, is human innovent, in, innovation and inventions. And this is a particularly for, big uh, factor. So those five factors, the um, wealth and um, the, the printing of a lot of money, creating a lot of debt. The second is the internal conflicts. Third, the external conflict. Fourth, acts of nature. And uh, fifth, um, the technology, and they operate in big cycles. You can see these cycles over and over again. In, in the book, you'll see the charts measuring all of these things, plus many others, and they form these big cycles. And so by knowing where we are in the cycle helps me today. Now, when we look at 500 years of history, we think, oh, why do we look at that? That's so big and irrelevant. But these issues right now affect us at the moment, the debt and money situation, the internal political situation, the uh, external. We see it day by day, and they together are going to are determining the environment we're in. So that's the background, I hope, of our conversation today. 
Sure, great. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Ray. Uh, excellent. Uh, you you have uh, really very uh, uniquely pinpointed out uh, uh, the five major challenges actually we are facing today. But you have also looked at that into the uh, historical uh, 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 you know development as well. Uh, absolutely right. I think you know talking about uh, your your first observation on that. You know, in the 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 your debt debt issue, uh, uh, printing of the money and and all those things. Uh, that has, you know, come to public to a stage. I don't know how how sustainable that that can be. So perhaps uh, on this uh, first two, and also the second, I think that the 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 you know rising populism, which I think we we are facing a deglobalization right now, and uh, how we can really uh, meet that challenge, both for U.S. and China. We we all have that kind of issue, of course, and uh, and uh, and also the so those two probably are most. Uh, uh, you know, come to 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 the to the to the attention of the people. You know, that issue. I mean, uh, China may be less serious, but U.S. is really, uh, in a particular after pandemic, is getting more challenging now. And but populism is uh, is another issue. We see a polarization in the uh, in in both U.S. probably also in China and other countries. So, what what do you think about uh, the current situation we are in on, on those two issues? First, let's <laughs> let's have some uh, thought from you, perhaps. Yes. There are two cycles, two debt cycles. There's a short term that usually is a, what they call a business cycle. On average, it's averaged about seven years. In other words, from recession to growth to bubble to recession, about on average seven years, give or take about three years. And those have added up over a period of time to a long-term debt cycle because debt levels have risen relative to income levels. And the way it works mechanically is very cyclical because when you give credit, you give buying power. And But credit comes with debt and debt is the necessity to pay back. And therefore, when you pay back, that is not stimulative, that is depressing. And so it produces that cycle. And because central banks don't want the bad part of that, they stimulate more and more at those cycles. And so the debt levels and, and, and build up. Um, and one man's debts are another man's assets. And so that balancing act continues, and that's the, the cycle. So in the world right now, mostly led by the United States, but other countries too, particularly Western countries, uh, you're seeing it, uh, the cycle, you're at the part of the cycle where there is the short-term cycle where there's a tightening of monetary policy. And that tightening of monetary policy to fight inflation, because you know the cycle works. You put a lot of credit and and stimulate, and you create a lot of debt, and then it picks up the economy, and then with that um, it produces inflation. The amounts that were created are unprecedented, except in the 1930 to 45 period. The amounts of debt, so they produced an inflation. It should be not surprising. You produce a lot of credit a lot of buying, it produces a lot of inflation. And so now you're seeing that tightness of monetary policy, but still you're producing more debt than you are paying back. In other words, the spending is greater than the incomes of the United States and a number of countries. And so that builds up. So we're in the tightening part of the short-term debt cycle. We're also at a stage in the cycle where the long-term debt cycle is a problem because um, there's a lot of paying back. You cannot sustain a spending more than you're earning because then that re reduces the returns and so on. So we um, are in a situation where even uh, the United States dollar as the world's reserve currency is coming more into question, um, partially because the United States is no longer the dominant trading power. So for example, China counts for a higher percentage of world trade than the United States does. 
And up until recently, it did not denominate that trade in uh, Chinese currency, in RMB. But increasingly, there is a desire both on, on the parts of those who are transacting internationally in, and in China to increasingly diversify their reserves and their transactions. And so you're seeing that um, happen. So um, that's very relevant. Now, that is happening at the same time, as you, as you point out, as there's internal conflict. And that internal conflict is a wealth conflict. You know, um, there are big wealth gaps. Mm -hmm. And with those big wealth gaps, there are big values gaps. And those you're seeing cause great political gaps and greater extremism. So in other words, is this resolved, this financial situation, is this resolved through taxing the rich more or transferring wealth? And because taxing anybody is politically challenging, you see more printing of money. But it has an economic impact, and it also creates an anger internally. And so you're seeing that polarity. The conflict that we saw on January 6th, by way of example, or that which is going on with Brazil and, and exists in a number of countries, is that gap between the wealth and also the gap between the values of how a country should operate. Very classic left and right. So we're seeing those things operate. So as we look ahead, we see a tightening of monetary policy having a depressing effect on markets. Markets are down significantly from their highs. Most markets are. And then you're seeing it have an effect on global economic activity, uh, generally speaking. We could talk about China separately. It mm -hmm. operates more independently. But if you take the world outside of China, that's the pattern. And mm -hmm. so if you look at 20, 2023, 2023, because of the tightness in monetary policy, will be um, a, a, a year of a stag, relative stagflation, relative stagnation. Depending on the world, you look at different parts there's Europe, there's Japan, there's the United States, and then there's emerging countries, many emerging countries. Um, and then we could talk about China if you like. Um, sure. um, it has its issues. So sure. and then 24 will be another political year, mm -hmm. a very important political year. I, and populism is a um, win at all cost type of operation. So when you see, for example, recently, when you see a trouble of Republicans to find the House leadership, and you see um, extremists um, block and win it all, try to win at all costs, you see these this degree of internal conflict. That affects the effectiveness of government. And it also will mean in 2024, there'll be a big conflict. So that's what it looks like uh, to me. Of course, we should talk about the third influence, which is the US-China relations and issue, yeah. its issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, thank you, uh, 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 Ray. I, I think you have uh, described very well the, the current state of, of, uh, of a world uh, situation, political situation, and of course also uh, the, the deglobalization, what's going on, but particularly, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, where, where, where is the uh, root of the cause of the problem? I mean, <laughs> and the cause effect uh, result. But, but you're right, you know, that, uh, you know, U.S. now have a, have a, have a large debt issue. And, uh, and also, of course, uh, uh, you know, many other Western countries probably have that. And, and China, you know, trying to avoid that. And uh, uh, that's created populism, nationalism, and that leads to the internal uh, uh, conflict, as you describe it. And that's where I think also, if if we come to the to the China-U.S. relations, uh, if if we have so much domestic challenge now, maybe externally then we have a much more 
uh, uh, you know, scapegoat or whatever, you know, that maybe we aimed at uh, other other countries for 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 anger. The uh, uh, you know what, and they are not happy at home. I was talking to uh, Richard Haas about uh, several weeks ago, and he was talking about maybe it's time that we we each every one of us you know, address more domestic issues, address domestic challenges, and uh, and uh, see how we can really avoid that. So you talk about China-U.S. relation, particularly in the last five, six years, it's it's constantly deteriorating, and uh, uh, we could talk more. You have uh, several wars on <laughs> between China and U.S. going on, but uh, but what do you give assessment about this uh, uh, problem of China-U.S. relations and how we can really, uh, I mean, on both sides, how we can really get 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 along better? And we have a uh, Secretary Blinken. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is coming uh, probably in February, and uh, how we can uh, improve that. And also, you, 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 China just uh, completed its 20th Party Congress. A new leadership will be lined up uh, later this year. And of course, 2024 is the U.S. election. Uh, but but given this transition, how we can really uh, having a new new <laughs> equilibrium or balance or, or narrative, rather than now we have to. Uh, you know, seems we have a lot of uh, uh, odds right now. So, so you are a great uh, China hand, and you you have knowledge on both countries so well, and uh, and also of the world. And uh, we'd love to hear you view on those uh, uh, you know those urgent issues. I guess for for both countries, how can we avoid this kind of a big power rivalry? Uh, as some uh, you know scholars describe, uh, or he should this trap as uh, our friend uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, Alison has been talking, you know, Brian, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, there's a great pull to it. There's almost, there's a great almost destiny. When you follow these cycles, you see that when there are domestic problems, such as what we're talking about, um, and then the gap between world powers narrows that there is no longer um a matter of um the the conflict uh tend is has a high probability of rising because like in 19 um when this world order began the american world order in 1945 the united states accounted for half the world's economy it had 80% of the world's money, which was gold at the time. It had a military dominance. And so, of course, there was not going to be the same kind of conflict. The conflict with the Soviet Union was not um, comparable because there was not comparable economic conflict. But now, when you have suffering at home, there is, yes, there's blame. There are sections, a lot of populism goes back to um, whether you lost your job and why did you lose your job? And it's a combination of um, the, the billionaires at home and the uh, technology and the Chinese um, outside is, is, is the perception. It, it mm. was not, before there was an appreciation to be able to buy things inexpensively from China and to be able to change ex, trade that for the debt. You know, wow. I remember when um, per capita income in China was 140th the United States mm -hmm. and China lent money to the United States yeah. to buy Chinese goods. And that was once a good deal and now it's resentment. So you start to see the populism happen for that reason. But um, if there was not a comparability in power between the two countries, there still wouldn't be a fight. But with this comparability, um, the world um, doesn't have a world court. They don't have a way of resolving it. And so there's conflicts. And in history and now, there are five kinds of wars. There's a trade war, a technology war, a geopolitical influence war, a capital and economic war, and a military war. And we are certainly in the first four of those. And there are risks about the fifth. 
And so um, it's all it's very difficult to get out of. Um, because how are such disputes resolved? So there's a certain there's a conflict that history has shown over and over to be the case. But you're right to focus on domestic at the end of the day, though if, if you want to be the most powerful and win a war, be strong domestically. Be strong domestically. And that has to do with the basics. Earn more than you spend. Be productive. E educate your population well. Be civil. Don't have internal conflicts. And so um, both domestically and internationally, these basic fundamentals Earn more than you spend, be yeah. civil with each other, work well together, and all of those are what will determine the strength. So yes, there's a there's there's a destiny to this. There's almost a you know a very, very big pull, not just because of patterns, but the patterns happen because of reasons that now exist. Yeah. Now, what do you do about that? Yes. Okay. What you do about it first, I think, is to recognize that you should be very fearful about a military conflict, each side, because the power to do each other harm has advanced enormously, enormously like great technologies. So the great technologies of doing each other harm are greater than ever before. So there must not be that. So that fear of that, we all should be fearful, everyone in the world should be fearful of that and then deal with that at all costs. And I was very happy to see that President Xi and President Biden's um, dealing with that question was primary in their last meeting. And that is what's leading to Secretary Blinken's uh, visit. So it's a very, very delicate, but the fear of mutually assured destruction should be a very great fear, and that's a motivator. I don't think the other competitions are going to change. I think they'll intensify. Trade war, technology war, geopolitical influence war, economic um, and capital wars. I think that those will... And and that'll be a test of the strength of the two systems. So that I think that that's what we're looking forward to. So we must not have that military war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Ray. Uh, that's an uh, excellent analysis of uh, of the current <laughs> situation. I, I know to actually uh, President Biden proposed uh, uh, actually OECD and G7 and then late G20. Oh, great to, to propose this uh, global minimum tax, uh, where I think the multinational, you see, Fortune 500 companies, I mean, even including China, now have more Fortune 500 companies now than probably US. When they operate worldwide, they, they, they should have the minimum tax so that they can you know, benefit both the home and host country. So there probably is a tendency now where this company operates worldwide, but then they left to the Midwest or, or, or Rust Belt or, or, or interior of, of, of the country. Uh, that you know that were the uh, you know the uh, blue collar uh, workers not benefited from this uh, globalization. That's where you know uh, politics is local and and business is global. So <laughs> this kind of situation, uh, particularly probably U.S. experienced that uh, in the early early phase. And China will probably continue to do that. Uh, you you mentioned there's no global governance. Uh, that's precisely you know where um, you know WTO, uh, IMF, UN I mean, is not functioning as as in the fixed fifties or sixties or early days when it's established. The Britain Wood system is probably uh, uh, ineffective now. So 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 how can we really uh, safeguard this multilateral system and really work together on that? I mean, you mentioned also the the the, the access of nature and also the, uh, the 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 technology and all those happening. Uh, uh, how can we uh, the big countries work together to avoid that? Otherwise, I think, uh, as you said, competition is continued. But where is the cooperation? So, 
Uh, and China is rising. I mean, lifted 800 million people out of poverty, contributing 70% of global poverty reduction, actually, for that period of time, and uh, which China doesn't export uh, refugees or famine, and uh, which is helping the world uh, stabilize, as you said. Also, we provide uh, uh, affordable, uh, good-priced product, kept inflation low, and... Uh, uh, you know, China is 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 become the largest trading with 130 countries. So, so how can we really, you know, resolve that uh, differences and then really uh, mutually ac acceptable? I mean, <laughs> or reach a new equilibrium? I mean, we are certainly in this pro progress of uh, uh, trying to sort it out with each other, adjustment made uh, for each other. But absolutely, you are right. We cannot go to the hot war. That's that's <laughs> that's devastating, and that's. Uh, uh, that's that's terrible. We are already facing the pandemic, facing the climate change, facing all those uh, natural disasters. Uh, you know, we cannot afford to fight among ourselves. So, so what do you think of the solution? I mean, how not go to the hard war? But you are a great expert economically and uh, uh, on on the trade and, and investment. So, can they intertwine? I mean, you know, we are also different from the Cold War era because we are so much intertwined. Economy it depend on each other. Uh, uh, now, if U.S. is trying to decouple, you, you talk about six wars. I mean, you have five wars. Also, you said about culture wars. And <laughs> so we are, we, are, we are pursuing those uh, wars in the sixth front. I mean, eventually we could probably, you know, drift apart. And, uh, and then when we, we have no connections, maybe it's easier to go to the war. So how can we really get tighter, not, not, uh, not uh, you know, get, get separated uh, from this uh, intertwined world as a business? I, I mean... Yeah, your, your thought, please. Um, I, think, I, I think that um, it's very likely that both countries are dealing with the possibility of war and for that reason do take action for self-sufficiency. The building of technologies, for example, uh, that are dependent that one is receiving from the outside world and one is dependent on um, needs to be done in both countries so that there is an um, increasing move toward building that self-sufficiency. That's inefficient, uh, but it redirects the economies in that way among the great powers. There are other countries in the world that are not in this great power rivalry. India, the ASEAN countries, the Middle Eastern countries, and so on. And um, in many ways, they are becoming more global because they are benefiting from some of the um, conflict um, for those who want to avoid conflict they're moving there. They're moving their capital or they're moving their production to other places while this is taking place. I think we're going to see more of that as a result of this dynamic. And to be neutral in these wars, in this conflict, is a preferred path that most other countries are on, they want to be on. And as a result, you are seeing globalization take place in different places in different ways. So I think it's important to distinguish the countries that are in conflict, China, Russia, the United States, Europe, to some extent, NATO countries, and so on, for those that are not in conflict and don't have many of these issues. You know, there are countries, if you want to pick what the good places are. They are those that um, are earning more than they're spending, take in more revenue than they're spending. They have a good income and balance sheet. They have limited internal conflict. They work well together. There's harmony and effectiveness. And they are not in external conflict. And so you see in some countries that people from all over the world, including China and the United States, are going to some of these places because they become places of opportunity while the others are in conflict. I think that's a I think that that's a trend. 
I don't think it's the end of globalization as much as a movement of globalization to other places because this power of, exists from globalization. You know, when you get the best minds and technologies together, wherever it is, it's a very powerful force. So I think that that is what we're going to see more of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ray, and uh, that that's very, uh, uh, very uh, frank and <laughs> straight analysis. Uh, that, yeah, that's that's something very unfortunate. That you know, if we get into these two uh, spheres or, or two two you know scope of of the world, I mean, uh, I, I see China actually pursue a more economic globalization, where I think U.S. now is you know. Uh, is probably still, I mean, because they have, uh, you know, win the Second World War and then, then they're still playing some world, uh, safeguard world uh, order that they established, but more on the security side. You know, for example, the NATO has now taken uh, more countries in and now also uh, you have Five Eyes, you have, uh, uh, you know, Biden administration basically set up, uh, uh, you know, Quad, uh, Security Quad uh, Alliance, and then AUKUS and, yes, for nuclear submarines. And, and then, you know, all those, uh, you know, around China, all those military stuff, uh, IPF, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, even, you know, have those, those uh, ASEAN country in that too. But then we see China is competing, actually, you know, China has launched the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, China has joined RCEP, and China is even jo wants to join CPTPP, which is designed by the U.S., wants to join DEPA, it's a digital partnership. China has started a China-African uh, cooperation China signed the uh, economic uh, investment treaty with the European Union, which hasn't been affected because of the sanctions. But China also recently started with a Latin American, but recently with uh, Arab countries, you know, like summit between China and the Arab leaders just last month. So do we see a more two lines of a globalization more on economic, but China pursue more economic globalization, whereas I think U.S. pursue more security globalization. But, you know, yeah. I mean, but in those countries, it's difficult to pick the sides, as you said. There are some countries doesn't want to get involved on in that. Now it maybe has to pick sides, which is not healthy, and we're probably going to bring the world slowing down, or even in recession if we continue like that. So what do you think well, about I, I, Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think that most countries will not pick sides. Yeah. And the alliance is... Now, it, I, I understand there'll be a lot of pressure to pick sides. But at the same time, I think most countries aren't. And you, and, uh, you can see that in um, the UN votes on the Russian issue. You can see that on trade deals. As you say, for example, in the Middle East, um, uh, President Xi's visit, you can see the, uh, uh, all the uh, deals that came out of that visit. When I go around the world and I speak with world leaders, um, they often ask me, um, which side should it be, U.S. or China? <laughs> and, the, and then they say, and, and when they go through it, they say, if it's economic, it's probably China. If it's military, will the United States be there when we need it or not? And that, that's kind of a popular thought. But by and large, you could see most countries are out are are behaving outside of that alliance to try to you know just go on and that's benefiting them india is benefiting from this uh indonesia is benefiting from this many some number of asian asean countries middle east is benefiting from this in many ways so i think that that's our new normal Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That that that's that's good to to know. That uh, <laughs> I really hope those countries don't don't you know don't you know, not forced to pick sides because, you know, I mean, eventually uh, uh, people are, are economic you know uh, uh, driven. I mean, they have to pursue a better life, and uh, and then you know they 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 if they have a good uh, uh, you know trade and a good prospect for <laughs> of bring the table food to the table with good quality i mean they will continue that life uh, they they have enjoyed so so i yes, think so at the same yeah. time oh yeah. i'm sorry for the interruption please go ahead no problem no no, no. go ahead please yeah go ahead go ahead at the same time during periods where there are risks of war everything 
economically is put secondary importance. Mm -hmm. History has shown this because, you know, um, throughout history, um, for example, um, even um, in the Korean War, you know, um, China and uh, the United States was then a dominant power, but the but because of sovereignty, um, you know, um, uh, Chairman Mao was a very famous in saying at the times, so "There's 700 million people. You can't kill all of us. They can't kill all of us." <laughs> and to defend sovereignty, sovereignty and other issues are of paramount importance. So economics always doesn't rule in World War One. They were um, they intermarried. It was run by um, uh, kingdoms, and they would and they still went to war. So war, uh, when you have the risk of a war, you have um, economics will take a secondary role. Of course, it's a predominant. It's the most important thing under normal circumstances. But for example, now the idea of being self sufficient. And doing things that are might be econo uneconomic, but on the other hand, guarantee that you can have your supply, that you have your production. That is of like paramount importance. So yeah. I wouldn't. It's it's correct. I agree with you that economics is important, but at such times, you can't necessarily assume that um, the highest living standards. It's not a big deal. Since I started coming to China in 1984, per capita income has increased by 28 times. Mm. Uh, as you point out, life expectancy increased by 10 years. The poverty rate went from, in terms of being hungry, went from 88% to less than 1%. Amazing uh, achievements. If there was, um, negative growth even some negative growth a recession of negative growth in china in comparison to where china has been that you'd almost have to be spoiled to complain if you're if you're taking um what you look at the whole living standards so sometimes it's expected that people will um not um necessarily put a, a, a decline in their living standards as paramount importance. People sometimes have to suffer a little bit for the greater good. And you know that any Chinese who studied history and the dynasties and so on knows that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No. Yeah, no, Ray, this is, uh, this is fascinating. I think that, uh, you know, we, we are living in a world since World War II, uh, 77, 78 years ago. Uh, the world has really uh, prevented the Third World War because of the uh, prosperity, the boom we had, uh, you know, through uh, World Bank, uh, IMF, WTO, and all those things. And now we have all those new trade arrangements. So, so we hope that we continue. But you are right. You know, you mentioned about this, uh, this, uh, you know, this internal conflict, uh, uh, populism, uh, nationalism is rising. And that's really driven us apart and not forced us to be decoupling or self-sufficient. And that may lead to, you know, cut down our ties and, and, uh, and uh, our connections. And we'll be driven to self-prepared uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the hard war. And, and that's really, yeah, it, yeah, you know, that's, that's really dangerous, uh, <laughs> I would say. Uh, because uh, it's precisely, we, we, as we discussed at the very beginning, we want to... You know, both U.S. and China wants to address its own problem. You know, let's f fix our own houses rather than we, we look outward, and uh, and for other countries too. So, so if we can really working diligently on our own and then uh, not really blame each other, probably we could uh, still continue our some uh, engagement uh, with each other, particularly uh, uh, the trade. I mean, is uh, you know, it probably is the best medicine for for keeping uh, everybody. Uh, you know, still intertwined. And uh, I look at your, you know, your, your this great book. I mean, it's really uh, fascinating. Of course, you, you talk about three big cycles. You know, you know these uh, those uh, 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 internal order. Of course, the debt, and of course, cycle of external order. And uh, so we're we're talking all those issues. But you talk about other. You know, there are some eight key 
measures of power, eight, eight key measurement of how we can do better domestically. You know, maybe let's, if we concentrate on domestic issues, you talk about uh, innovation, technology, cost of competitiveness, uh, you know, military strength, trade, economic output, markets and financial uh, center and reserve currency status. And also, of course, the, there's, there's, there's other uh, factors too. So education can, is very important. That's right. So is very important. Yeah, Edu education and uh, and uh, those. So 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 now China is catching up on education. For example, it currently has two hundred eighty million people who has has a college degree, <laughs> and every year they produce ten million graduates of a college. And uh, so so if every country is focused on that, uh, and and then uh, you know maybe we could still. Uh, you know, find a way to 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 cooperate, uh, uh, cooperate with each other, rather than we have to be in this rivalry mode. And and I don't know how far that's going to lead us, uh, but I it's certainly not good for uh, future generations. So so I, any advice you would give to uh, uh, to both uh, uh, both countries and how we can continue to live uh, peacefully? I was I was talking to Joseph and I, I mean uh, Harvard professor, some time ago last year. He was saying, look, there's a twenty year cycle. You know, of course. Uh, uh, you know, now we are in a, a very agonizing period where we are a very difficult, challenging time. But maybe uh, in uh, 15, 20 years, we will reach a new equilibrium. Maybe, you know, China will, uh, will of course, accept U.S. U.S. will accept China because China already accepted globalization, accepted the, this boom that trade has bring China. And China wants to maintain the existing global order and uh, Whereas the U.S. now is, 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 is probably wants to change that. So how can we change for the better rather than we have to di divorce the couple? And that's really bothers uh, all the people here in China, probably. I, um, it is so much better when mm -hmm. we work together. Um, there's the fear. There's, um, I have a, a principle. If you worry, you don't have to worry. And if you don't worry, you need to worry. Because if you worry about something, you will prevent the thing you're worrying about. And if you don't worry about something that might happen, you won't prevent it. And so first, I think worrying about this conflict is a good thing. I think then also that if you look at the opportunity of what the world can be like when we work together, which we, we have seen that, that that is a beautiful world. If there's so much more creativity, there's so much more harmony. I love the harmony and people who've experienced it. And so it needs mutual understanding. It's why conversations like this and spending time in both places is so important. So there's a lot of upside to um, harmony and working together. And there's terrible downside for not doing that. We all know that. The question is, can you get away from, you know, what's called the prisoner's dilemma? Yeah. <laughs> the prisoner's dilemma. If you know, if, if you don't know if the opponent is going to kill you or work well with you, even though it's in your both interests to work well together, the logical thing is to kill the opponent. Mm. And that dynamic and that competition is the, is the threat. So we know that this greater good. I just hope that um, as we uh, work together, maybe in these different ways that we can achieve that, but we have to be realistic. So I think that if we have peace, a military, I think that we, you know, I, I think the Taiwan issue is a big issue. Mm -hmm. And it's our only great threat issue. And I know what it means to China. And I know the issue. So, uh, but if we can deal with that issue, somehow and we must then um then there's just the competition and yeah. okay it could be a difficult competition or it can be a cooperative competition but it will be a competition and that's okay
Yeah, the Graham Allison talk about this cooperative uh, 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 competition, and then also Joseph Knight talk about this <laughs> cooperative rivalry or something. Yeah, that's probably the the, the status we could uh, we could reach. But you're right. I think Taiwan is is really uh, the 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 as I also described in your book as the major <laughs> uh, you know risking uh, 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 spot uh, in our relation. But I think, you know, uh, I really hope that uh, I, I still uh, a bit more uh, on the economic side. I think the economic integration between mainland and, and Taiwan, for example, before uh, uh, current uh, uh, President Chai Ing-wen took power, you know, China and mainland, uh, Taiwan mainland and, 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 and already get the merge because of millions of tourists flooded in Taiwan, China buying a lot of agricultural product from Taiwan, Taiwan enjoying huge surplus of trade with China and uh, with mainland. And, and also, of course, uh, you know, there's over one or two million Taiwanese working in the mainland. And there's uh, several hundred thousand marriages between uh, mainland across the street uh, with Taiwan. So, so if we pursue that economic corridor and then integrate eventually, I'm glad to see the KMT recently in the midterm has uh, swept all the mayor seats and the KMT recognized 92 consensus, which is a one China principle. So. So hopefully, you know, if we do not have uh, so many senior level uh, officials or congressmen, or senators or speakers visiting Taiwan, and China would be less reaction to uh, across the midline, midterm, uh, you know, flying over. Maybe we can, you know, still keep the status quo. I think you're right. You know, we need to visit each other. We need more congressmen, senators visiting China rather than visiting Taiwan. Let's have, uh, you know, see how China is... Uh, uh, function uh, pretty well, and uh, and uh, and then maybe you can avoid this kind of a distrust, uh, as you said, this personal dilemma that uh, we are in. You know, we really hope that we're not getting to the point that uh, uh, devastating to 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 the to the world that we are we are facing. Yes. So, so I'm I'm very glad that you you mentioned that. Uh, now maybe we could uh, talk a bit more on the on the on the a bit looking at the 2023. Now we are we are in the New Year <laughs> time and. Uh, uh, China just uh, lifted the, uh, uh, you know, quarantine uh, travel uh, lockdown just uh, the day before yesterday. Now everybody can freely come to China. China, uh, the, 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 the Omicron is, seems to uh, reach a large herd community now. And uh, uh, we, we, you know, everybody, you know, the, the, the traffic is busy and the restaurant is full. Cinema is, uh, is now starting to people going back. And uh, so we hopefully there will be more people coming. So what, what do you think of, of, of 2023 that, uh, uh, you know, post uh, uh, pandemic, uh, both for the U.S. economy, Chinese economy, and of course the world, and uh, uh, how, how, how we can, uh, you know, take uh, uh, opportunities of this uh, uh, after three years uh, uh, locking down. I mean, for example, in the, in before the locking down, China has outbound tourists, 150 million of them. And we hope to, before the pandemic, we have 5 million uh, traffic between China and the U.S. And we still have a lot of Chinese students going to U.S., uh, over 300,000 currently in the U.S. So so uh, hopefully this people-to-people -people exchange, business exchange, will we, we, we'll stabilize the situation. Let's not deteriorate, not, you know, free-falling, and but uh, maybe stabilize and maybe escalate a bit. Uh, so so w what's your advice to, 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 to stabilize the relations for, for both uh, China and U.S. Uh, after post-pandemic? Um, well, I'll, I'll I'll deal with the question of uh, the, the the U.S. and the uh, economy outside, and then uh, the Chinese sure, sure. situation. Um, yeah. Twenty twenty three for the outside world, outside of China, is going to be a difficult economy because of the tightening of monetary policy, the issue pertaining to the Ukraine war, and uh, uh, other matters. It's going to be um, a difficult year. Something close, depending on what country you're looking at, but on average, um, a, a recession year um, uh, with relative stagnation. Um, that um, creates an environment. If you were taking, let's say, if we look at China now, that just that piece just um, represents a poor export market to sell into. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one thing. So if I look at China, I think that um, with the new leadership, 
they'll be challenged taking on some of the challenges and the challenges um um as you mentioned there's a covid challenge which we have much i think more reason to be optimistic because of that there's also an economic challenge arising from the um, real estate and associated debt problems that have come to uh, local governments and have become um, sp <clears throat> spread in, into the system that can be dealt with. And my hope is that as we come to 2023, that those economic issues can be dealt with because whatever debts that are exist in finance are, are in the local currency. And so the ability to deal with that, I think, is there. So, but that is a factor, as you know. The um another factor um uh is um the change in uh you know the what is the regulatory environment as it pertains to um, large tech companies and so on. Um, that's improving, I think, that that's creating. And there's a lot of development of an entrepreneurship. You know, like I'm, I'm, the Little Giants program, for example, which I'm sure you know, and the development of the Beijing Stock Exchange for those types of entrepreneurial companies is a stimulation. And there's a shift in the economy to, I think, a healthier economy. Because when you, as um uh chairman uh, um uh president Xi said um when you build house uh, houses housing to um speculate on rather than to live in it's a waste of resources and so there will be a redirection but there's an adjustment process that takes place for that there is also um the issue of um um uh safety in the world there's and i think it'll improve but the idea um internationally can we safely produce in these countries that are in conflict and the movement to those so these are challenges i think they're not big challenges not very big challenges in the scope of things what matters most is the strength of the leadership and i do believe that um a um common prosperity is what both countries need because mm -hmm. without common prosperity that benefits most people then you have the internal conflict so i think that this is an adjustment period 2023 is an adjustment period and there's new leadership and i think that um but there are those challenges and um, i think we're in the adjustment period in both countries I think that uh, China's growth rate will pick up. Um, my estimates are, um, and, and there's nothing precise about them, sure. but maybe four and a half to 5%, okay. something in that kind of position, which in the United States, we would consider that a boom mm. if we have four and a half percent growth. Yeah, so yeah. that's what they look like. Europe, though, will be stagnant. The United States, South America, lot the emerging countries generally will ha be having a difficult time in 23. So you, you're a great investor. Maybe uh, at the end of our talk, you can give us a bit of uh, uh, analysis of uh, uh, about what are the category or product or, or sectors we should uh, focus in the next <laughs> year or two. Uh, you know, I mean, energy, I mean, still I mean, with the Ukraine crisis going on. But what about uh, climate change or clean uh, technology and uh, or other other you know uh, uh, t technology de development AI or so so what are those uh, uh, new uh, uh, sectors that we should really uh, look into and maybe uh, country and regions that we should uh, uh, pay more attention to uh, in terms of looking at the global uh, uh, where we're going to put our money <laughs> or, or investment uh, uh, into that uh yep. perhaps yeah so maybe you 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 are you are the vice uh, the wisdom of the vice please um diversification of good places and good industries is very important and so i would say uh, good places are places in which there is more income than spend than expenses 
that they're profitable, that they have good income statements and balance sheets. What are a country's finances? This is very important today. What will the, those who are financially strong? And you could see it, income statements and balance sheets like people or companies. The second is internal conflict. If you have great ex internal conflict, so it becomes dysfunctional and creates uncertainties, great uncertainties, that is disruptive. If you have harmony and you have unity and civility, these are all measurable. So the finances, how people are with each other, and then um, number three, is there a risk of an international war? Because countries which have a risk of an international war will suffer from that in various ways. So the regions I look for are places that are exempt from those things. In addition, when I look for technologies, when I look at new areas, I think you're going to see revolutionary changes in the way we lived. Disruptive technologies are taking place all over the place because um, the computer has supplemented the mental intelligence. And so we have an ability to invent like has never existed before. And those developments are creating very big disruptive technologies in many, many, many areas. So it, yes, we can talk about AI, but you can carry it to um, biotech. And you mm. could carry it to, as, as you say, um, green technologies, which are necessary. Uh, but so many, many areas where there are gonna be technological revenue um, um, uh, achievements. It depends on then the, le the level of that technology. The only two countries in the world really who have the scale and the level of technology to do it in a big way is the United States and China. And there are, of course, technologies are developing everywhere, really, in many places. But that, uh, so you have to look at those. Um, uh, disruptive industries, I think, um, that are going to be powerful because the greatest power, we talked about these four influences, the debt, the uh, internal conflict, the external conflict, the acts of nature, in other words, droughts, floods, and pandemics. But the greatest force over time has been human innovation uh, over time. Most of these are the four have come and gone. And they might take place over 10 years. Sometimes, you know, a, a depression usually lasts a, a few, very for a brief period of time. Internal conflict, wars, even wars. How long do wars last? A few years at most, usually. But the force that is the greatest force is human innovation and technology. And it's never been greater. So to understand those technologies in those regions, I think is important. So investing in those with those criteria in mind, I think is most important. Diversify among those that have those attributes, I think. That's really great. And, uh, and uh, such a, uh, you know, very uh, uh, unique uh, summary of uh, what's going on and, uh, and also give a great advice uh, to, to our, our future looking at the scope that you just described is, is very valuable, very valuable. So, so I think we have uh, uh, covered quite a bit of uh, our topic today. <laughs> we, we talk about, uh, you know, all those great dynamics going on that uh, uh, affecting uh, the world, affecting the U.S. and China, and, uh, and also how we can really solve our own problem uh, with uh, our internal, uh, 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 you know, uh, efforts and avoid this uh, uh, widening gap, uh, uh, you know, between uh, the polarized society and, and of course, also, how we can uh, get along with other other countries also uh, is is absolutely important. How to, how to avoid this uh, uh, military conflict is extremely and and not picking sides, of course, for other countries. And of course, we we look at the future. Where where are the growths? Where are we? Uh, 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 you know, have to make more efforts. And of of course, also in twenty twenty three, where's uh, uh, where, where are the bright spot? Where are the <laughs> uh, status quo? And how we can lead that into a better 
uh, uh, future development. So, so all those issues. But I'm, I'm, I'm very glad now we are. We seems you know get a pandemic over, and then we can start a more normal life and normal international exchanges. And then, and that's why I really hope that we can uh, welcome uh, uh, Ray and and other uh, U.S. friends coming to visit China. You you've been traveling China since eight, 1984. That's that's remarkable. I've been I started going to North America in 1984, but I, I as you said, you know, we see so much changes uh, in China taking place. I, 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 we witnessed that, and uh, so it's it's the, the the business leader like you to really say that and then you know telling the people who are younger generation and and pass on your advice is so important so maybe in the end maybe we we have ready to say a few closing remark and we hope that uh, china and the us will, will continue to cooperative but of course we have competition but not really uh, getting into a conflict so so for for, for cooperation uh, and uh, maybe we have more, uh, you know, healthy competition, Olympic style, but no conflict uh, and trying to avoid that. So uh, we have your final wisdom and uh, your closing remark, uh, Ray, please. Well, I don't know about the wisdom, but I'll give you my closing remarks. <laughs> um, I think that conversations like this, I think that relationships, such as those that you and I have, those that you have with Americans and American leaders, and that I have with Chinese, Chinese leaders and Chinese friends, is um, so great. And I think that the truth is, we've never had it better, really. That China's condition, the living standards, I've seen the difference. And, and and so our living standards are really higher than they have ever been. And the communication is really greater than it's ever been. And there is this, uh, this threat, but the, most likely um, the fear and the wisdom will prevail and that we will continue to build on our relationships, I believe, as long as they, we don't waver in pursuit of those types of friendships. You know, I sent my son when he was 11 to an all Chinese school. Yeah. <laughs> He's the only foreigner in the Chinese school and so on. And he says he became a bit Chinese. And I know the relationships. And I think that there are many who understand those relationships. So I would say that that is a powerful force to understanding and we just can't have to continue to have these types of conversations and these kinds of relationships. And I believe that that force will is a great force that will win out in the end. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Ray, I mean, I mean, I, I really uh, what we have discussed today is uh, uh, in a lot of this principle for dealing with changing world order, and we have that actually uh, translated by. Uh, city press uh, in Chinese uh, version, which has become the bestseller already now in China. And uh, we really appreciate uh, the Ray taking the time to jump uh, CCG Global Distinguished Dialogue Series. And we have uh, learned so much. And we're going to really, uh, uh, you know, re uh, uh, we'll play this and we'll actually transcribe and we'll, we, we have a book actually with uh, all the other distinguished uh, dialogue series. And I really appreciate uh, your, your time to uh, join us today. And uh, we hope to see you in China pretty soon in uh, 2023. And we look forward to the future uh, cooperation between China and the US. Thank you so much, Ray, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, see you. <laughs>